So I've been monitor I've been observing, casually observing um, this one beaver dam on Clear Creek for a couple months, and I have seen just a lot of destruction. And very recently, I saw a parent and child, and this parent was kind of like tenderly on one knee, pointing at the beaver dam and explaining something to the child. And I just thought, well, this beaver dam must remain. <laughs> That's community values, it right? It is, it is. Um, so Mary yeah. and Brian um, have been working on a, a little bit more thinking behind that, a thoughtful per approach on beaver suitability in our stream. So please welcome Brian Murphy with Riverworks, and again, Mary Powell. With, thank you. Thank you, Holly. Appreciate it. Just FYI, I feel a lot more relaxed on this presentation than my first one, so I'll try to enjoy it. Um, yeah, as Holly mentioned, you know, beaver dams um, elicit a lot of different responses from different people, and it certainly depends on the perspective. When you're the parent pointing out, a, frankly, an enormous um, rodent uh, that lives in our, in our streams and rivers, it's pretty impressive, right? Uh, and what they do, so that's great. And sometimes there are problems, though, um, with regard to the effects it may have on our stream systems. So a while back, um, Morgan Lynch, when she was at the district, started a, a, an effort with the city and county of Denver because Denver was struggling with deciding if a beaver dam was okay, is it not okay? They tended to um, break them up pretty frequently. Um, the beavers always come back. Um, so Morgan started an effort that I took on and had Brian Murphy help me with to come up with an adaptive uh, management plan for uh, the city and county of Denver on how they address the presence of beaver in streams, certain streams. Um, so that's kind of the purpose and need. They, they wanted a clearer, more transparent decision-making process that they could point to as to why they were either getting rid of them or leaving them or doing some sorts of um, management in between. So the presentation generally is going to follow, I, well, I just went through the purpose and need, and then we're going to just talk a little bit. Brian's going to talk about the desktop mapping and analysis that was used for the, the project. Um, including the Beaver Restoration Analysis Tool, or BRAT, that's been developed out of Utah. And then we're gonna, uh, Brian will go through sort of our decision-making flow charts, um, <laughs> decision-making flow charts, but you know, they work, um, on how you address beaver in a particular setting. And then finally, uh, Brian will just go through some takeaways. So again, the purpose, Denver was facing challenges with how to manage beaver in this system and we wanted to figure out how to help them. These are some photos of a uh, beaver dam, uh, a tree that's being eaten by the beaver, some trees that have been felled by the beaver, a bunch of little nice looking stumps that are left, and here's some flooding of a trail. There's a beaver dam and it backs up the water and it inundates the trail. And finally, here's a, this was kind of what precipitated the whole thing. There was a monster beaver dam on Cherry Creek, kind of near Cherry Creek, uh, shopping mall, and it uh, was causing a very major bank erosion, um, and they finally breached it, but you can see it, it took a lot of effort to fix that erosion there. So um, that's the challenges and how to meet them. So again, did I go backwards? No. We needed to come up with a new way to do this. Again, they. The beaver management was taking too much time and effort. It was, they were doing the same thing over and over again, so we brought in the team to help. Um, so the stream system that we focused on was the perennial network that the district has right here shown on the map, which is a lot. But for the effort, we really um, zeroed in on Denver, but what we've done is applicable throughout the district. So if you're interested later, come up and talk to me and we can talk about ways that your local government may be able to make use of this tool as well. Um, so the way the dams, we did a census of the dams through near map and Google Earth photos identifying the beaver dams and we mapped them on the perennial stream system. I don't know if you, I, it's hard, to, I can't see what you see. 
Um, anyway, the figure on the left shows, um, oh, the Beaver Dam census. Someone just made it bigger for me. Um, <laughs> the Beaver Dam census on the left is over 10 years, and the census on the right, and there's more than 100 Beaver Dam that were located over those, the 10 year period. Uh, the, the figure on the right is the um, most recent 2020. 2021. 2021, which has more than 50 beaver dam um, within the district's boundaries. So now I'm going to pass it off to Brian, and he's going to finish up what we got. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad to not be talking about the urban stream assessment procedure. I, thank you, Mary, for giving that presentation earlier today. And uh, I'm going to pick up the story, kind of continue the story, and talk through our process uh, of developing this beaver adaptive management plan. It's still in the works. We haven't actually prepared the plan, but I'm going to touch on, the, as Mary said, the desktop mapping and analysis, and how would that we're going to capture that in the, the adaptive management plan and some of the decision making that goes into that. So I'm going to press that button and assume it's the right one. Uh, so the beaver restoration analysis tool, it may be the beaver reevaluation for the for some of our urban streams, uh, but this is a capacity model that Joe Wheaton and his uh, folks at Utah State developed to really look at um, a couple of different things: where, uh, at what level, beaver dams can be built and sustained. So it's not intended to say we're going to have one beaver dam here. Or, um, 17 beaver dams, it's, it really looks at a number of things, and I'll talk about the inputs in a minute. Um, the important thing is it attempts to identify kind of where reaches you could see beaver dam activity. And there's two things here, and the first is probably the most important for this uh, presentation, is it really does, co you know, where are we seeing potential problems? Where, where are we seeing conflict with infrastructure? Where are we seeing uh, conflicts with recreational? amenities, uh, and that was one of the impetuses for the work with, with Denver. Um, it also can help identify where there's restoration or conservation type of efforts, and we have downplayed that a little bit. There are some of that um, going on uh, in the decision tree that, that I'll touch on, but we're really talking about expectation management, and that's what the city and county of Denver was really interested in. How can we have expectations in a transparent decision-making process, not only for um, the, the, the kind of the, the, the politicians that might be asking, but also the general public. So a little bit about BRAT without going into too much detail. Um, it really can be done from freely available, nationally available data sets. Uh, in this case, we actually use the district stream network to start off with. Um, and the inputs typically are, um, there's some hydrology that's involved, slope, uh, vegetation. We look at uh, historical vegetation kind of pre-settlement vegetation to get an idea of what that capacity may have been. And then we also look at current uh, vegetation patterns. It can be run for the entire state. That's actually where Joe and his uh, colleagues at Utah State did it for the whole state of Utah. Um, the Colorado Natural Heritage Program has run it for the whole state of Colorado at this point. So you can go to CNHP's website and download the information from, um, from their, their BRAT runs. Um, it does make a prediction at the reach scale, so using the district's network, we were able to break this down uh, to, it could be a thousand feet or it could be a mile depending on uh, the district's network. So those were the general inputs. I will say that Brat's not attempting to say exactly how many beaver dams Steve Matarkowski is going to get to take out in, one e in any one year or anything like that. Um, it's only does, does, you know, that it, it really is looking at um, uh, as a model, it has some you know, outputs. You can determine, like any model, um, how accurate those results are, and that's why we looked at doing the census. Um, and it, it, it is helpful to be making management decisions, but there's still thinking that has to go into that. So I'm going to pivot now to some of the results for the district's network at the, at the actual district scale, and then uh, focus on the, the city and county of Denver. So. The historical capacity, again, this is looking at kind of pre-settlement, what the, those vegetation patterns may have been like. I can't tell if you can kind of see some of the colors in there. I'll just point out that there were many pervasive and, and frequent types of, of dams, and this is based off of stream miles um, across the district's network. So, you know, again, all models are wrong, some are useful. This is a, at least it telling us at a, at a snapshot where we um, potentially would have seen 
uh, more, for more pervasive and frequent activities of beavers across uh, the Denver metro region. So flipping to the existing capacity, uh, this is different. You'll see that there's much more uh, reduction in, or there's reduction in the pervasive and frequent, not surprising. And then there's a kind of a dramatic increase in the occasional and rare. And, and a lot of that's being driven by the changes in vegetation pattern. And, and that's one of the things that uh, has been interesting to, to think about this. And Mary touched on this in her earlier presentation of the importance of vegetation along our stream corridors. Not only has it an effect on the stability, but also of the wildlife and the wildlife corridors. So um, one last snapshot here of the output from BRAT. You can see the hopefully to some degree the census data so we use this for validation and verification of where we were seeing and expecting to see some more of the frequent and maybe pervasive uh, beaver dams across the, the region so i'm going to uh, shift here to talk a little bit about how we are approaching the beaver adaptive management plan um, we like wheels today this is the theme we've got lots of different wheels this is a an adaptive management planning wheel that, that looks at um, you know, the, the evaluate and learn and then plan, do, and adjust. And we're in the evaluate and learn phase right now of the adaptive management plan. Um, we will eventually have a plan for specifically for the, for the city and county of Denver and that Mary and others across the district can then apply depending on the interest of local governments. Um, and then going into the doing, whether that's removing beaver dams or letting them stay, those are the parts of the decision tree that I'll talk about. And really the components of the adaptive management plan are the, the management zones that we've developed specifically for the city and county of Denver and will generally be applicable for the district and then the decision making process. So the management zones, we have six zones. Uh, beaver, we have a beaver appropriate reach, um, low risk reach, which can mean that there are low risks there. There's, there may be some moderate or minor beaver activity. Um, there's maybe some important trees in that, um, in that reach that we want to watch, or um, there's potential for trees falling on a recreational corridor. So this would be an area that there could be some watching that's going on, but we're not overly concerned about it. The high risk reach, there's again, tr tree risk reach, uh, Terry Creek corridor is a great example where there are beaver activity, trees fall on the, the recreational corridor, those types of things. Or there's active management. We already know that, that the flood district or the local government is actively managing that reach, removing beavers or protecting the trees and so on and so forth. And the last couple, we have a beaver exclusion reach. It's a critical risk reach. We just don't want beaver in there for whatever reason it might be. Um, and then a non-beaver bearing reach, there just isn't beaver in there because of the vegetation or whatever it may be. And then non-beaver dam building reach, and that's a mouthful, that really uh, is applicable to the South Platte River. The beaver are migrating up and down the South Platte River, but it's too wide for them to actually build a dam. So we've classified that as a, as a reach where we know that there's beaver activity, but they're just not actually building dams that may have to be removed. So this is the map. Jumping forward, the map that we developed for the city and county of Denver, um, it's fairly interesting once you take out the, a, a lot of the, the black uh, lines are indicative of either storm drains or pipe systems, those types of things that you wouldn't actually see any beaver activity in. So once you get through that, uh, we really only had three you know, specific zones. Uh, we do have on First, Second, and Third Creek, I think, um, some of the, you know, the lower risk zones, uh, we identified a critical reach, reach, reach zone on Cherry Creek, and then you can see how we've classified the South Platte River as a non-beaver bearing reach. So now the, the city and county of Denver has this mapping, and we met with, uh, with Vicki and her team that, that go out and actually do a lot of the, the management and maintenance of beaver activity on the stream corridors. They can use this map to gauge how they actually make specific decisions um, and, and then show it to the general public. So you might say, oh, that's great. Well, so how do I use it? And this is now where we get to have some fun um, and go into the decision trees that, that we've been working on. So hopefully you can read that. This is just the question, you know, is there um, beaver activity in my reach? You can see I have the three different pathways there that it's a non-beaver bearing reach or it's a low risk reach, high risk reach, and so on and so forth. So let's just say we start at the top, go to the triangle. Here's where we, we, we start to see some decision making again that, that the staff, maintenance staff or local governments can, can have. And if you go to the, to the left, at least on mine, 
you can leave it alone. You get to hug a beaver, you're out of it, you just, you're going to leave it alone, right? Um, but that oftentimes is not the case in, our, in these systems. So you, you would have to move to the right and, and kind of ask the question, is it, is it causing problems? And if it's in a low risk reach, there's a couple of options. You can do an evaluation on a dam by dam basis. We have a decision tree for that. I know you'll be all excited to see that in a minute. Um, or, you know, if, if there is um, a need to, to go further into um, that, or that it's not actually a, a problem, and similar to the high risk reach, you, you can exit the tree and say, we can leave it alone, or it's a watch, something like that. Again, you get to hug a beaver. Um, now, we recognize that's not always the case. There's not, as Holly was talking about, the, the community value of a beaver dam. There's, there's potential hazards or whatever it may be. And so you're, you're moving down into the tree here further to say, yes, there's a potential of, of some issues or some, some concerns. And so on, on the right, re, again, related to, to the low risk, you can say, we need to be looking more closely at that beaver dam and, and um, monitor it and keep a closer eye on it, the watch the type of thing. In the high risk, it really comes down to, is, is it going to be causing problems? Is there a hazard here um, that, that we're really concerned about? <clears throat> the, the, the interesting thing is, if you, in the high risk side, you can move to the, to the, to the more of the, the dam by dam basis and be being able to make decisions. However, oftentimes there isn't that case where you can evaluate on a dam by dam basis, it just needs to be removed. And so there are programs out there working with uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife to do removals. And there could be relocations uh, to uh, locations within the, the district if there are opportunities for that. Um, or you can relocate, depending on CPW stance, um, outside of the district. And that usually makes Steve Matarkowski very happy. Um, so we're, we're t that's what I wrote down as my small thing, is to make Steve happy about my presentation. So hopefully that's uh, working out for him. So that overall is the, 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 the decision tree for uh, how you would go about at the high level deciding what, uh, what you, you, how to evaluate, particularly getting to the dam by dam basis. So this is the decision tree for the dam by dam basis. I'm not going to go through this in any detail just because of the amount of time and, and other things that we need to be moving on to, in particular lunch. But I will just give a quick example of, you know, it, this, uh, this dam, you know, is it, is it potentially causing problems? Yes. Um, is it related or just something that we can um, recognize or it's a continuing effort that we're looking at? and potentially that we need to be taking care of it, explore opportunities for trapping or whatever um, that may be. And again, that makes Steve Matarkowski happy of moving the dams out of there. There's a whole other part to this that looks at different either mechanical measures that you can install or working with different stakeholders potentially. Um, but for a little bit of fun, that's, um, that's uh, the, the case for this. And this will be available, this uh, presentation can be made available if you're interested in more information. So with that, the takeaways uh, really come down to a couple. Uh, beaver live along our stream corridors. We know that. We interact with them. There's this, you know, I think, change in how we look at beavers. They, you know, they are a rodent. They uh, are also amazing important engineers for our stream systems given the context, right? If they're, if they're a, a part of the context, in, in some cases they can be a part of our stream management. There is this aspect of expectation management. We can use BRAT and other type of tools to better understand where we would expect Beaver and how that might play into some of the decision making. Um, but BRAT in itself is not the adaptive management plan. It really helps inform some of it and help with expectations, um, but it takes thinking. And that really comes down to the transparent and def defensible decision making. And I think that's the greatest outcome of this process is now Denver in particular has a way to say we can go through and evaluate in critically on a dam by dam basis or on a water or on a stream where and how we want to manage the beaver on that specific. Um, and that certainly helps with uh, the political and regulatory considerations that come into um, dealing with uh, the beaver on our stream systems. So with that, uh, thank you. Uh, in particular, thanks to Vicki and her team, Sensoray, Ian, and also Mike Sermento was uh, very helpful in pulling together the information related to this project. So with that, I will end. And uh, I think we're, oh, there's one more presentation, right, before lunch? Yeah, so thank you very much.